a lot of dry weather here. It does stay very hot through the weekend across parts of Spain, but eventually some cooler weather on the way through the week ahead too. Nagra and Roger. Sarah, thanks very much. 14 minutes past nine is the time. Now, from Monday, fully vaccinated people in England and Northern Ireland will no longer have to self-isolate if they're told they've been in close contact with someone who's contracted COVID. Now, those changes have already come into force in Scotland and in Wales. Let's talk about this and other COVID developments with Linda Bald. She's the Professor of Public Health and virologist Dr Chris Smith, who are joining us both of them to talk about uh, morning. COVID this morning. Morning to you both. Good morning. Morning. Um, just just clear up, uh, Chris, I guess I'll g point this first one to you. Close contact, is that somebody in your household? Is it someone maybe in your workplace? Is there any difference? The definition of a close contact, it, it does vary a bit in different countries, but the definition we tend to use is a certain amount of distance for a certain amount of time. And that can add up over a day. So you could have very close contact for a short time or you could have prolonged contact over time, but at a slightly greater distance. But they all add up to the same thing. And that is, are you being exposed to what we dub an infectious dose of virus? You need a threshold exposure to pretty much guarantee you're going to you're going to get infected. Linda, um, so how how do you how can it be explained that from Monday if you live with someone who's contracted COVID, that you don't have to self-isolate? So this is a quite a significant change in policy. As Roger was saying, it's come in already in Wales on the 7th of August, in Scotland on the 9th, and then from Monday in Northern Ireland and England. The definition is changing because we've got more people who are vaccinated. So those that are double vaccinated 14 days after the second dose, or indeed the under 18s, if they're identified as a close contact of somebody who's confirmed as positive, even if they live in the same house, they won't have to self-isolate, but they will have to seek a test. And uh, a test, a PCR test, that's the important thing. So that's the more sensitive, specific test. And depending where you live in the UK, it's either a single test or a couple of tests over certain days. So do check the guidance. The reason it's happening is because we can't indefinitely, Naga, have this situation where people who are close contacts are shut away for 10 days, even if they don't have uh, COVID-19. As we know, the pandemic, so-called, I think it was 6% of adults in England were self-isolating between the 21st and 25th of July. You know, businesses were not functioning and it's had a big impact in schools as well. So this is a shift that's happened in the US, in Singapore and in other places. I know not everybody is happy with it. They think there are still some risks and there are, but it's just another um, part of us transitioning through this pandemic pandemic into a more sustainable, perhaps, way of living. And, and I know you've emphasised this, and we've got a couple of questions relating to this. This is for people who are double vaccinated, of course. Um, who wants to pick this one? Because we've got a couple of questions which I think kind of overlap. We've got one from Joe, which says, my husband and I are isolating because our daughter has COVID. On Monday, the rules change in England and Northern Ireland if you've been double jabbed. Does that apply to us or do we need to continue with our 10 days? And also, Jackie has asked something similar. Her son, my son, she says, double jabbed and previously had COVID, was pinged earlier this week, has to isolate until next Wednesday. Will the rule change in England mean he can end isolation earlier? So it's basically people who are isolating already, Linda. Yes, he can. So that is a really important shift. And in fact, when the change came in in Scotland, I had to quickly check with my uh, colleague, clinical colleague working with the government to make sure I'd got it right. It is an immediate change when it comes into effect. So that means if somebody's been identified as a close contact, advised to self-isolate by test and trace, test and protect, whatever the services in different parts of the UK, when the change comes in and they, are, uh, they get a PCR test which says they're negative, they don't have to self-isolate anymore. Uh, so that's a big change and it is it takes effect on the day that the policy changes. Um, Chris let's let's give you a question that's been sent in by Julie. Um, if so how does this impact you getting a negative test to fly? Uh, Julie good morning the answer is that you can test positive for quite some time after you've been infected and the reason for this is although you may no longer be productively infected in other words shedding infectious virus from your body the residuum of the infection you had leaves behind enough traces that it will trip over a test. A good analogy to think about is if you had a very vigorous party at your house, 
then the next day if someone came round, they'd know that there'd been a party in your house because all of the remains of the party might be empty champagne bottles in some people's houses for some particular practice such as traveling but just because you have had recent covid it doesn't mean you're going to fall into that situation but you do have a higher likelihood of testing positive for a period of time for the reason i've just outlined um, you just mentioned hospitalizations age and vaccination chris i don't know if you know the answer to yeah and, and just just to clarify it's it's not six thousand admissions a day there's about six thousand people in hospital that's about four right. percent of our nhs beds the number of people going into hospital is 700 to 800 per day. The number of people who are on ventilators is about 800 at the moment across the country. Eric's question though, he was asking if we know the age breakdown. So is it older people yeah. in hospital? Is it younger people in hospital? Is it vaccinated yes. people? Is it non-vaccinated people? Most of the cases are occurring in unvaccinated individuals, but we are also seeing breakthrough infections in some vaccinated individuals. Don't be alarmed by that, because we know that with any vaccine, there's always going to be a degree of, of vaccine failure. We get what are called non-responders. About 5% of people who have this COVID vaccine turn, into be non, turn out to be non-responders. So uh, about two thirds of the people who we're seeing in hospital are unvaccinated, who develop uh, hospitalised cases but that means that the vaccines are working very well in the majority of people. So uh, I, I think people should, should regard the vaccine failures as, as an unfortunate par for the course. It does happen. We as well, and also bearing in mind the flu season may be, or is likely to be much more severe, obviously, than last year, but it's something that we haven't really had to encounter in the last year or so. That's correct. And just a quick follow-up for Julie with the travel question. If you go onto the gov.uk website, you're concerned about testing positive with PCR. They are recommending lateral flow before you travel because that's less likely to pick up the residual RNA. That's just the final thing. On boosters, um, you're right. We are going to be hearing from the JCVI shortly. We know that people, particularly people who are immunocompromised and may not respond so well with both doses of the vaccine may need a third dose. There may be other groups who are eligible for boosters as well, but we wait to hear. And concurrent with the influenza vaccination programs, I think Chris said on Monday when we were on this program, you could have flu jab in one arm and uh, COVID in the other, but it'll just be particular groups. But if you're called up and you're eligible for either the flu vaccine or a COVID booster, please come forward. It's going to be so important as we get through this winter. Um, question um, you'd have seen in the news this week about um, the debate about herd immunity and uh, herd immunity is a very sound epidemiological medical term. We've been using it for decades. And what it basically boils down to is that if you immunize a population of people, you get to a point where even if you don't immunize everyone, the unvaccinated or unprotected people are protected by the fact that they're surrounded by a huge herd of immune people and the chances of a susceptible person running into an infected person in that population are so slight that you just can't maintain a chain of transmission of a disease. And you can achieve that protection either because people are vaccinated or because people naturally become infected and then immune to whatever the entity is. But I think there's some degree of confusion around whether or not we're talking about severe disease and prevention of severe disease, prevention of infection, which doesn't necessarily mean severe disease, you, than the fraction of people who are unvaccinated if they have a contact. So it does still have a very important role in slowing down the transmission of the infection through the population. And that's why it really matters that we get to as many people as possible, uh, as soon as possible, before we get into the autumn, because it really will help to slow down the ability of the virus to spread through the population and either cause cases or in unluckier people who are now becoming thankfully rare, severe disease. Uh, trivial question to end this. Um, both of you seem a little bit subdued today. I'm looking at your backgrounds. And Chris, you have some very small cacti. And Linda, your, you know, your floral display, it's pretty, but it's not statement-like as usual. No, we'll have to try well, harder now. I think <laughs> as we head into the uh, colder days, we're going to have to try harder. But to be positive, I was intrigued by Chris's reference to a vigorous check, party. Check, the, check <laughs> this one out, though. Check this one out. Now, this one looks phallic, right? Um, <laughs> I didn't want to draw too much attention, but since you have, I, I, I think that's the most intriguing flowering cactus I've ever seen. Wouldn't you agree? It, you, yes. It's yes. probably, probably it's got to make up for sea size, isn't everything? 
Well, uh, enough of that, Chris. Um, Linda, you were talking about... Look, I can see... See, Linda's face has said that, said it all. The nightmare for the broadcaster's experience. You were talking about a party, but I'm not sure what road this goes down no. after what Chris just said. <laughs> well, I think we're, we're heading into dangerous territory. I was just intrigued by the term a vigorous party, so we'll have to unpick that next week and tell you what that means. <laughs> On you that. haven't been to one of my parties yet, Linda. Oh, gosh. No, 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 no. Now restrictions are off. We're all round no, no, to Chris's no, 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 no. Linda Bold, Chris, thank you, Chris Smith. It's always You're a delight welcome. having you both. Take care. Look after yourself. Bye-bye. Bye. It's approaching half past uh, nine now. There's always a party when Saturday <laughs> Kitchen. I tell you, you can have a really good time there. Um,